tonight. The call for the reduction in the cost of governance gets louder. Governor Simon Lalong of Plateau State and APC Chief Bola Metinubu lend their voices. The bandits who kidnapped eight members of the redeemed Christian Church of God in Kaduna demand 50 million naira for their release. Lagos Judicial Panel awards over 16 million naira compensation for victims of police brutality. And more than 90 people killed as Myanmar Army opens fire on protesters. Plus, business and sports. On business news tonight, Nigeria's stock market records its first weekly gain after seven consecutive weeks of losses as key indicators rise by more than 2%. And on sports news, Niger Super Eagles qualify in style for next year's African Cup of Nations in Cameroon after beating Ben. The abductors of eight members of the redeemed Christian Church of God in Kaduna State are demanding the sum of 50 million naira as ransom before they can be released. The members of the church were abducted at gunpoint along Kacha Road on their way from administration. The state police public relations officer, Mohamed Jalinge, said the command is working closely with the leadership of the church and the state to rescue them. Snappers made two demands. First, 50 million naira, and then 20 million naira. Another new parish. Now they are going at about, they left the premises by the, at about 4 o'clock. So getting there, something at about 6 o'clock, I mean 6.30 to 7, when at, along Kachar Road, where the kidnappers now ajacked them and took them away. Uh, this morning, we were able to go to that place to check the area and recover the church bus back to the region headquarters. Just about like 10, uh, 10 to 8 kilometers to a post of the military. That is the army base where they normally do check a point there. So the soldiers there, even when I went there to ask them uh, details, they also tell us that when the incident occurred, the kidnappers used bikes to convey those people through the track road. When we came back, I was hearing when the secretary was uh, telling, um, I think either the secretary or the pastor, or the, the main pastor of the regional headquarter, which is the, our, our pastor for the regional headquarter was saying that they call, uh, I think that the, uh, that is our region uh, pastor, that they should bring 50 million. And the soldier also tell us that they out of some of the people they kidnapped also along that road that they were now saying that uh, those they call the family of those people to bring no less than 20 million to. From Kaduna, we move further north to Ronu State, where the army says its troops have killed several Boko Haram terrorists in an ambush along Chibok Dambua area. In a statement, the military explained that it acted on credible intelligence that some remnants of insurgents were fleeing due to the intensity of the firepower by soldiers in the Sambisa forest area, killing nine terrorists in the process. In another military operation, the army says its troops laid ambush on insurgents fleeing Askira Chibok main supply route, killing 39 terrorists. Eight victims were also rescued, while one of them sustained an injury to the leg while in the hands of these abductors. The statement adds that the troops have taken over the area with aggressive patrol and are equally on the trail of fleeing terrorists in order to locate and neutralize them.
For Nigeria to tackle the lingering security and economic challenges caused by banditry, kidnapping, terrorism, poverty and unemployment, speakers at the 11th Arewa House Annual Lecture in Kaduna State say government at all levels must come up with programs and policies that will address the problems of youth unemployment by spending more to create jobs and reduce the cost of governance. These are the submissions of the governor of Plateau State, Simon Lalong, and the former governor of Lagos State, Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, at the annual event in honor of the former premier of the northern region, Amadou Belo. It's a gathering of seven and former governors, the chief of staff to President Muhammadu Buhari, other top public office holders, heads of security agencies, as well as members of the academia for the 11th edition of the annual Arawa House Lecture in Kaduna State. The event is put together to honor the late Premier of Northern Region, Sir Amadou Bello, and also to discuss issues affecting the region with a view to coming up with solutions. In his lecture, which focuses on the reduction of the cost of governance for inclusive growth and youth development in the Northern Region, the chairman of the Northern Governors Forum and Governor of Plateau State, Simon Lalong, says there is a need for all tiers of government to cut down on the cost of governance. It's very hard to say that another dimension to the high cost of governance in Nigeria revolves around the issue of continuing of public appointees of government from the federal, states, and local government. This high expenditure is attributed to the large number of cabinet maintained by governments at this at this stage of government, largely to either pacify political, regional, religious, and other interests with the attendant high salaries, allowances, extra costs, and the like. Currently, at the national level, there are 28, 28 ministries 44 ministers and about 215 government departments and agencies. In 2011, the Presidential Advisory Committee, led by General Tiwa Danjuma, expressed concern over the high cost of governance and advised that, quote, government should begin the process of merging and reducing the federal ministries and other government agencies to help cut down on government unnecessary spending. The chairman of the occasion and national leader of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Tinubu, on his part says the fact that the nation is going through the debilitating challenges imposed by COVID-19 makes the discourse on reducing the cost of governance timely. Cost of governance is always a key factor in socio-economic development of any nation, but it is also one side of that important coin. We must not look at the cost alone. We must weigh the cost against the benefits derived therefrom. For example, one can pay a high cost on a productive enterprise, but reap a higher benefit. Such would be considered a good investment. However, one can pay a low cost but reap no benefit at all in the endeavor. We inherently say it's unproductive. There will be a waste. Thus, we must be careful in what we say and truly mean when we talk of cost of governance. Apart from addressing the issue of the cost of governance, of the former governor of Lagos State also provides tips on how to deal with the problems of unemployment. The development of any populous nation has always been dependent on the ability of government to allocate sufficient funds to projects and programs that create and encourage enduring growth and employment. We must reject that mode of thinking that assumes government expenditure is inherently unproductive as well as harmful to the 
overall economy. For the governor of Kaduna State, who was represented by his deputy, the time has come for leaders to think outside the box when dealing with present and emerging security and socioeconomic challenges. No matter the severity of the challenges, elected leaders and other elites must discharge their obligations to enforce the rule of law and protect the right of every citizen to live in peace and safety. Delivering the president's address at the occasion, the chief of staff to the president, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, says reducing the cost of governance is a collective responsibility of all, as that is the only way to free up resources for development. We must not assume that the problems of our country should and can be solved by President Buhari alone and his administration. Yes, he's going to be leading, continue to lead by example, but state governance, local government leaders, traditional authorities, religious leaders, civil society groups, and yes, even the media have a responsibility to work collectively and put the interests of our country first and foremost. As the wind of COVID-19 pandemic still blows across the globe with its negative impact on the economy, coupled with security and other socio-economic challenges, the takeaway from this lecture is the need for those in leadership in the northern region to critically prioritize the economic development of the region. Another conference by the speakers of the 36 states houses of assembly held in Bochi state also brought to the fore crucial issues affecting the country, top of which is the agitation for state and community policing to address the issues of insecurity. Part of the communique from the conference is the implementation of legislative autonomy to carry out efficient legislative duties. The conference has also set up a constitution review committee. Speakers of 32 state houses of assembly gather for their first quarter general meeting in Bochi. Indeed, they share the pains of Nigerians over the lingering security threats. The outcome of a closed-door meeting they held suggests a way out of the security quagmire in a five-points resolution. The conference decries the state of insecurity in the country and while commending the federal government on its efforts at fighting the insecurity in the country, the conference calls on the federal government to tinker with the insecurity architecture in the country to reflect the demographic reality of our country. In other words, the conference advocates for community policy as a way out of the problem of insecurity in the country. Another issue emerging from that meeting is a resolution on the effective implementation of financial autonomy for legislators. While state assemblies have been tasked to ensure that they soon pass the funds management bill, the governor of Bochi State, Bala Mohamed, finds the agitation for autonomy appropriate when he received the speakers. I support fully the executive order bringing you autonomy, but I urge you too to look at the other side of the coin because it is coming with a lot of challenges. Managing the expectations of your members, managing the challenges of lawmaking, at the same time managing executive responsibilities within the legislature is going to be an added responsibility. While the state lawmakers also resolved to have their inputs captured in the ongoing review of the 1999 constitution, the Emir of Bauchi, on the other hand, makes a case for a better working relationship between the executive and the legislators. I hope that the state assemblies will emulate this style of leadership where collective interest of the state is the common focus, no party allegiance at all costs. The federal government must try as much as possible to allow state police so that the state police can also contribute immensely to arrest most of this unfortunate uh, situation happening all over the country. The legislators ended their gathering with a rare legislative oversight on some of the projects embarked upon by the Bochi state governor. We return to Bronu State, where barely three days after electricity was restored in the capital city, Medugri, Boko Haram terrorists have plunged the northeast city into darkness again after blowing up a power tower today. 
In January, the terrorists had struck power installations thrice to keep the city in darkness. It took power authorities almost two months to repair the damage inflicted in January as the insurgents laid the landmines with injured officials of the transmission company of Nigeria when repairs commenced. Repairs had to be in progress under heavily, heavily garbed, guarded security operatives as residents and business owners turned to alternative power generating sets for electricity. But that elation now seems short-lived after today's incident. Midugri, the capital city of Bronu State, has become a target for insurgents as the Nigerian military continues its offensive against them. In part two after the break, participants at the inaugural Guardian Women's Day Summit advocate participation of more women in politics and end to gender discrimination. That's in a moment. Join us again. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The call for the reduction in the cost of governance gets louder. Governor Simon Lalong of Tatu State and APC Chieftain Bola Ahmed Tinubu led their voices. The bandits who kidnapped eight members of the redeemed Christian Church of God in Kaduna demand 50 million naira for their release. Lagos Judicial Panel awards over 16 million naira compensation for victims of police brutality. And more than 90 people killed in Myanmar as army opens fire on protesters. The Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Anwar Gambo, is assuring residents of Anambra State and other states in the southeast region of adequate security following recent attacks on security formations and operatives. He made the comments in Oka as he begins his first operational visit to naval outposts across the country. He assures the state government that the Navy remains committed to ensuring peace and security in the country. The Onicha Naval Outpost, established since 2010, is a beehive of activity as the helicopter bearing the Chief of Naval Staff lands in the field. This is the maiden operational visit of the newly appointed Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Awal Gimbo. He received a special salute from the Guard of Honor. His presence in the outpost is meant to boost the confidence of the men of the armed forces, but first, he moves to the governor's lodge in Onicha for a curtsy call on Governor Willie Obiano, who expresses joy over the visit and over the prompt intervention received from the Navy in the face of the security challenges of the state. He, in turn, receives reassurances from the Navy chief. Uh, I'm extremely delighted. Uh, we had a very good uh, discussion long before now. Uh, when we had the incident we had here uh, that uh, led to loss of lives, uh, he quickly reacted promptly by sending a special crack team, and those guys are doing a great work. Uh, he came with very senior officers uh, uh, commanding the various sector, uh, segments in this area and beyond. And uh, uh, I want to once more welcome him to Anambra State and uh, use this opportunity to thank him for his prompt, very prompt response uh, uh, when we had the challenges we had uh, a few weeks ago. This my operational visit is uh, very timely, though with deep reflection because of the loss of our men. Your Excellency, I also want to acknowledge um, the support and succor you have, gave, you have given to our affected staff, including those of the of, of the Nigerian police, uh, it's um, it's uh, noted, and it's uh, it's noble. We thank you immensely, and I want to assure you that we continue to support your efforts uh, to make sure that peace, peace, permanent peace, returns to Anambra State. On the heels of the visit of the Naval Chief is also the visit of the new General Officer Commanding GOC of 82 Division, Enugu, 
who's come to meet the governor and reassure him of his readiness to work with other commanders on ground to devise ways to tackle the emerging security challenges in the state and in the zone. With these collaborations and deployment of security personnel, it's not expected that it will be business as usual for criminals and armed attackers. As tactical and strategic operations to keep the peace and maintain security has begun. President Muhammadu Buhari met with his Chadian counterpart, President Idris Dabi, today for bilateral talks at the State House of Uja. The two African leaders discussed and went into a closed-door meeting to look at the nation's security challenges and recharging the Lake Chad area. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Omezuke, has this report. The president of Chad, Idris Derby Itno, arrives the forecourt of the presidential villa on a one-day official visit. Received by his host, President Muhammad Buhari, the two leaders exchanged greetings before proceeding for bilateral talks behind closed doors. During the meeting, President Muhammad Buhari reacted to the drastic decline of water volume in Africa's largest freshwater body by about 90%. He underpinned an urgent need for water transfer to Lake Chad from the Congo Basin so that people can resume their normal lives. After the meeting in a press conference mediated by an interpreter, the Chadian president responds to questions on the region's multinational task force. This issue of the multinational uh, joint task force, that uh, the situation where it is only able to carry out one operation a year, uh, makes things uh, very difficult and the task of uh, defeating Boko Haram uh, uh, more uh, difficult. Uh, but um, with, the, with the new security apparatus that has been put in place with the new chiefs of staff and uh, not only in Nigeria, uh, the, the, the security chiefs, but even uh, on the multinational joint task force itself, which also has a new leadership, that, um, that we're hopeful now that uh, with new strategies and uh, new uh, dynamism that we'll be able to uh, address definitively uh, the issue of uh, Boko Haram. He also responds to the burning issue of recharging the Lake Chad. Uh, it's something that is not just for Africans, uh, the impact on it, uh, the environmental uh, impact of the shrinking Lake Chad, but it uh, affects humanity. So the hope is there that we will achieve this, but um, the, the, the challenge is for us to be able to now realize the dream. The Marshal of Chad currently standing for re-election for a sixth term in office departs with a confidence that implementation of talks between Nigeria and Chad on the region's major challenges would speedily gain results. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. The Minister of Water Resources, Mr. Suleiman Adamu, wants state governments to increase financial investments to address inadequate safe water supply in the country. Addressing a news conference to mark the 2021 World Water Day, Mr. Adamu believes that it's time to enlighten the public on the economic importance of water. He adds that the Nigeria Water, Sanitation and Hygiene Account for 2018 states that the federal government and her development partners have spent 3.6 billion naira for the provision of water infrastructure in different parts of the country. The ministry intends to do more in the following areas. Increase public awareness about the value of water and public participation in water projects and programs. Improve partnership with government at all levels, especially in the area of adequate budget allocation for water interventions. Increase advocacy for the water resources bill across the states. Encourage relevant stakeholders to increase resource mobilization and enhance investment in water infrastructure. Integrate multi-sectoral actions in COVID-19 response and recovery. And finally, upscale water sanitation and hygiene intervention programs. 
Today, as we commemorate 2021 World Water Day on the theme Volume Water, the Nigerian Watch Account. More is exactly what some residents of the nation's capital are asking the federal government to do regarding water, and they are lamenting the scarcity of water in the federal capital territory. Now, several areas have been hit by the death of water. They include Kubwa, Apo Legislative Quarters, Durumi, and other locations. Now, residents of Durumi had to scramble for water from a stream as business owners lament the impact of scarcity and what it's doing to their businesses. Water has become a precious commodity for residents of Durumi as water scarcity hits parts of the nation's capital. This stream is the only source of water for residents of the community and they've gathered here to carry out their domestic chores. Since last week we started suffering about water, we don't know whether we are still using the water. Look at the water we are using now, it's not good. Like some of us now, maybe I don't talk, I will not talk on my own, but some people now, they, 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 are, they have sickness. If they use this water to drink or do anything, cook, it can bring any more sickness for them, it's not good. Esther Badu operates a restaurant in the community and the scarcity is affecting her business. The small pepper soup I'm cooking now, how much jerrycan am I going to use? Like five. That's almost 1,000 naira. It's too much. Two, 200 per jerrycan. It's too much. The scarcity also extends to some highbrow areas in the federal capital city, including the Apo Legislative Quarters, which houses some members of the National Assembly. This is National Assembly Quarters. This is where big men they live as I know water. No anybody complain. Because some people get bowl, some people never get bowl. Now the people where they get bowl, now then they go help the people where they don't have bowl. Kubwa Satellite Town is another area that the scarcity is having a major effect on. Residents have to depend on good spirited individuals to be able to get water. This means some would have to leave their offices to get water for the family. Definitely I'm supposed to be on my way to work, but you can see. What, um, what one is passing through. You have to come out, look for a place to fetch water and take care of other things before going to work. Ordinarily, it's not supposed to be so. So you can see that it is really affecting one's activities. The acting general manager of the FCT Water Board explains that the scarcity was caused by a burst pipe which affected some parts of the nation's capital. It was really unfortunate that we had a pipe burst in the lower Osman Dam, that is where we produce water. So now we have come to plan B as to do some welding and other engineering uh, network to make sure that we restore water. The FCT Water Board is pleading with residents to exercise some patience as engineers from the board are working to fix the problem and restore the supply as soon as possible. For the stories now, the Guardian newspapers and the Women in Management and Business and Public Service has launched its maiden summit to honor women as part of this year's International Women's Day with the team Women in Leadership Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. Participants at the summit believe education for both gender, women participation in politics and implementation of legal reforms in the country may help bridge a gender gap. Every child has the potential to achieve great things. But for girls everywhere, that potential is caught short by discrimination and inequality. Women are disadvantaged. To further push the conversation around gender equality, the Guardian newspaper, Women in Management and Business and Public Service and other partners host a maiden edition of the International Women's Day, which is both virtual and physical. Achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world aligns perfectly with the goal five of the 17 sustainable development goals by the United Nations, which states, achieve gender equality 
and empower all women and girls. Opportunities for the dedication of girls are shrinking by the day. The wife of the Ekiti State Governor, Mrs. Bisi Fayemi, is a keynote speaker. She reels out some strategies on how to sustain the gains women have made so far. For example, there is the constitutional reform process happening as we speak in the National Assembly. Those of us in the women's movement have been pushing for affirmative action and quotas to bridge the gender gap in leadership. Next is a panel session that is moderated by Channels Television's Malpe Ogun Yusuf. The panelists include the guest speaker, Mrs. Bisi Fayemi, Chairman of First Bank, Mrs. Ibuku Awoshika, the United Nations Women Country Representative in Nigeria and ECOWAS, Ms. Comfort Lamthy, Director Enterprise Development Center, Pan Atlantic University, Mr. Peter Bamkoli. For two parties, education and equal opportunities for both gender is key to development. Get the kind of education that they deserve and that they desire to pursue every opportunity that is, that is available to the best of their ability to have the opportunity for leadership and governance at any level in any field of their interest. If we don't create that same epoch as we are challenging and we are helping to build the girl's child, we must also be mindful of the boy child. For another, the implementation of legal reforms is necessary. We do know that we also uh, need to have, beyond just having legal reforms, we need to also put our money where our mouth is, and that's cost, you know, so we need to also ensure that there's sufficient resources allocated once we have the reforms to ensure that they are effective implementation. Okay. Okay. Wonderful moderation. Awards are also given to some women in recognition of their achievement and role in public service. The International Women's Day is celebrated annually on March the 8th to commemorate the cultural, political and socio-economic achievements of women. The Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 and the River State Government have agreed on modalities to enable the federal government safely resume operations of international flights at the Port Harcourt International Airport in April. The modalities agreed on include the provision of an isolation center, transport, security, and the setting up of a tribunal to prosecute offenders or by the River State Government. These gentlemen are members of the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 and their presence in River State for a meeting with Governor Nyes on Wike concerns the resumption of international flights from the Port Hackett International Airport. We need to identify a quarantine facility, uh, which is a hotel, where people who do not comply with the protocol will now be kept for a period of about eight days. This hotel facility will be arranged by the state government. However, the passengers, as a way of deterrent, will be the ones to make payment for the period of stay. We will need to have the security beefed up at the airport. The River State Governor concurs that the international wing of the airport should resume operations, directing his cabinet members to see to requested demands. Uh, the issue of uh, identifying a quarantine hotel. What the road commissioner is there, uh, he has to do that to make sure that from now till Monday he gets a hotel. And the issue of security, of course, you know that the representative of the CP was there. So I will also call the CP to make sure that it's being reinforced because security is key. If we don't have much security there, and even taking them from the airport to the hotel, he also seizes the opportunity to clear the air on whether he had taken the COVID-19 vaccine or not. Taking vaccine is not undertaking any project for anybody to see that you are taking the vaccine. It has done to politics. You know, assuming what I'm taking is not the vaccine. Yes, I can pretend. And then they put it on your body say you have taken the vaccine. 
Africans. So, they don't like to play politics in everything. You call the press. Governor Secretary has taken. Governor Ayer has taken. Governor Abroad has taken. It's not, it's not necessary. International flight operations in River State is important, but more important than this is the safety of travelers and workers at the terminal to the extent that relevant agencies follow due protocols before the reopening. State Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS and Other Related Matters has handed out checks to four deserving petitioners of police abuse and brutality. The chairman of the panel, Justice Doris Okobi, gave the sessions in six petitions and found that the four had successfully proven their case. Two others did not get any compensation. Our judiciary correspondent, Shola Shireli, has the rest of the story. After weeks of testifying and tendering relevant evidence, these petitioners are here to hear the verdict of the Lagos State Judicial Panel on restitution for victims of SARS-related abuses and other matters. Others who are yet to put in their testimony are also here to be heard. The petitioner's case was not challenged or controverted. With these words, the chairman of the panel, Justice Doris Okuwabi, gives the decision in the highest compensation awarded for the day. In the case of Tolulokwe Okpeniyi, the panel found that she successfully proved that her husband, Olu Shegun, was shot dead at a checkpoint in August 2017 by a police officer, Jide Akintola, attached to the Saboyaba police station. The panel made the following recommendations. One, recommendation for prosecution of the officer Gide Akin, Akintola. Two, recommendation on scholarship for one biological child of the victim. Three, 10 million naira compensation. Four, adequate and speedy compensation of victims or family of victims and cost of compensation to be set aside by the Nigerian government for the police. The check is presented and is followed in quick succession with presentation to three other petitioners. Felicia Okpara, a young woman who was captured in a viral video of October 12, 2020, following an alleged assault by some police officers in the Ojuelegba area C of Lagos, was compensated with 750,000 naira. Blessing Esambo was compensated with a sum of 5 million naira for a permanent disability to her face as a result of gunshot injuries caused by police officer Emmanuel Okujo, who is now serving a 17-year jail term for the assault. Tela Adesonya, an officer of the Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Services, was awarded 500,000 naira compensation for his unlawful arrest for three days, the seizure of his car since 2018 till date, and for the extortion and trauma he suffered at the hands of the police officers. The panel also recommended the immediate release of his car. Here's how some of the petitioners reacted to their compensation. There is no money they will give me that will be enough. For instance, they took my car since 2018, uh, June 2018. It had two serious accidents in, in, in the custody of the police. And I said I want a replacement. The panel is telling me today that I should go and take that car back. I won't take it. I will not. I won't take that car. Now, I was detained for three days for no reason. No case established against me, and you gave me half, half a million. What is that going to do for me? But something I've achieved today, I have worked for my posterity. I am glad. My lawyer asked for 12 million naira and 200 naira for my phone damaged. I was compensated with 750,000. Is that adequate in your opinion? <laughs> with government issues, I think whatever happens, happens. This, I don't know. I'm fine. I'm okay. You get the major thing is. What happened should not happen again. It shouldn't continue. We shouldn't be living in fear in our own country. In the petitions of Francis Idum and Ola Dunya Demola, 
The panel was unable to recommend monetary compensation as both petitioners were not convincing in the case made against the police. The panel recommended further investigation into their cases. Inability of counsel for, for those hoping to hear more from Dr. Lawson, the trauma and orthopedic surgeon from Reddington Hospital, they'll have to wait a little longer owing to the absence of the counsel who was to conduct the exercise. We will adjourn proceedings in this investigation to another date. Two NSAS protesters who were at the Lekki Toll Gate on the 20th of October 2020 have also testified as to what they know about the incident. When we were sitting down, singing the national anthem, I saw people being shot at. I stand up to pick to try to assist someone that was injured beside me, hit by a bullet. So as I was trying to help him, uh, I don't even know how it came. I just discovered that uh, a bullet hit me on my left leg. So while the, the army was shooting, was shooting at us now, I, I know there is a, a barricade in front of me like this. Immediately I just draw the barricade close to myself. Then the next thing, blood just uh, split at the barricade from my chest and I knew I was hit by a bullet. The victims also showed the panel some of the injuries they said they suffered, while the panel also admitted some of their medical records in evidence. The panel will hear from more petitioners at its next sitting on Tuesday, the 30th of March. Shola Shieli, Channels Television News. What's happening in the world of business? Here is Teniola Shobowali. Thanks a lot, Melinda. Welcome to Business News. After seven consecutive weeks of losses, Nigeria's stock market made a strong 2.17% comeback within the fourth trading week of March. The rally at the market is largely attributed to investors' renewed appetite for stocks following the recent release of improved financial results from some high-value equities on the NSC. 48 equities recorded significant increase in their share price, led by 30% gain on the Stambic IBTC. 18 stocks recorded losses, led by 15.46% drop on livestock feed, while 96 equities were unchanged within the five trading sessions. However, the total turnover of shares traded were lower, more than 50%, in contrast to last week's turnover as 1.53 billion shares change hands in over 20,000 transactions. Earlier this year, Nigeria's stock market was ranked as the world's best performing stock market before it began to tilt southwards following the migration of investors to the bonds market. To company news now, FCMB has released its full-year 2020 earnings, showing that the lender posted a higher profit of 19.61 billion naira compared to 2019-17.33 billion naira. According to the results posted on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, profit before minimum tax and income tax was higher at 21.91 billion naira, while income tax expense stood at 1.86 billion naira as at December the 31st, 2020. Total non-performing loans to total gross loans and advances was lower at 3.29% in 2020 from 3.67% in 2019. FCMB has proposed a cash dividend of 15 copper per share for the year ended December the 31st, 2020. The Association of Bureau de Change Operators of Nigeria says 26 members have been arrested by security operatives over issues relating to money laundering and terrorism financing. The president of ABCON, Aminu Guadabe, made this known in a statement sent to Channel's television today. He, however, appeals to the authorities to expedite their work to ensure that innocent people have uh, been caught up in this uh, investigation can be identified quickly and released 
released. Meanwhile, the APCON president says he expects Nigeria's foreign exchange reserve to improve in the coming days on the back of rising oil prices, as well as the expectation of $1.3 billion loan from the World Bank. And that's it on Business News tonight. I'm Tenyo La Shibuale. It's back to you, Melinda. Hey, thanks, Tenyo La. On the international scene, dozens of people have been killed by security forces in Myanmar on the deadliest day since last month's military takeover. The killings on the country's annual Armed Forces Day has drawn renewed criticism from Western countries, with the U.S. envoy describing the violence as horrific. Defying military threats, protesters gathered across Miami as the country marked Armed Forces Day. They were met with force as security operatives came out in strength to prevent rallies. The Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, a local monitoring group, says more than 90 people were killed across the country and the death toll is likely to rise. Children are reportedly amongst the injured and the dead. The latest deaths take the number killed in the suppression of protests against the February the 1st coup to more than 400. A day before, State TV had warned in a broadcast that protesters risk being shot to the head and back without specifically saying the army had been given shoots to kill orders. The lethal crackdown was all happening as the country's generals celebrated Armed Forces Day with the military leader reiterating a promise to hold elections without giving a time frame. Russia's deputy foreign minister was the only foreign diplomat evident at the event normally attended by scores of international officials. This week has seen the United States and Europe impose new sanctions on the military leaders. Officials have also condemned the latest violence, with British Foreign Minister Dominic Raab calling it a new low. Over in Turkey, protesters have taken to the streets of Istanbul for the second straight weekend. The protest against President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's decision to withdraw from international treaty to tackle violence against women. Last week, President Erdogan sparked anger with the announcement that Turkey was pulling out of the Istanbul Convention, named after the Turkish city where it was drafted in 2011. Turkey was one of the first signatories and women say their safety has been jeopardized by Mr. Erdogan's move against the European Treaty. Justifying the decision to withdraw, the presidency argued that the treaty had been hijacked by a group of people attempting to challenge Turkish social and family values. According to the Turkey's We Will Stop femicide platform, at least 300 women were murdered last year, mostly by their partners and about 171 others were found dead under mysterious circumstances. A fresh effort is on the way to refloat a giant container ship blocking Egypt's canal. Canal authorities say 14 tugboats are trying to take advantage of high tide and more will arrive on Sunday if the latest attempt fails. The Ever Given became wedged in the canal, one of the world's busiest trade channels, on Tuesday. More than 300 ships are stuck on either side of the blockade. Some have had to turn around Africa. And for what's happening in the world of sports, Kayode Okikiolu joins us now. Well, thank you, Melinda, and you're welcome to Sports News. Substitute Paul Anachu scored the late match winner for the Super Eagles of Nigeria to qualify in style for next year's African Cup of Nations in Cameroon. 
The Super Eagles now have an unassailable 11 points to win the group before Tuesday's final qualifying match in Lagos against Lesotho. The three-time African champions become the 17th team to book a place at the tournament. In Bosnia and Herzegovina coach Sivai Lopetev has tested positive for COVID-19 only days ahead of their 2022 World Cup qualifier against world champions France. The Bosnian squad were tested after the return from Finland, where they drew 2-2 in their opening qualifier. The Bosnian Football Federation says all the players and staff tested negative. The 45-year-old Bulgarian, who took over from a uh, coach in January, feels well and has no symptoms. Since independence in 1992, Bosnia have only qualified for the World Cup finals in 2014. Well, Greece's Euro 2004 winning captain, Theo Zagorakis, has been unanimously elected president of the country's football federation for a four-year term. The 49-year-old played for the Greek national team from 1994 to 2007, earning 120 caps. He has been given the mandate to revive Greece football that has been engulfed in leadership squabbles, racism, crowd violence and match-fixing in collaboration with FIFA and UEFA. Zagorakis is a member of the European Parliament for the ruling Conservative New Democracy Party since 2014. Here in Kenya, the uh, government has suspended all sporting activities in the country as part of efforts to control the spread of COVID-19. But this is the second time sporting activities have been halted after a similar order was issued in March last year. The suspension could have a major impact on athletes preparing for the Tokyo Olympic and the Paralympic Games. Well, that's Sports News for tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Kyoto Kikilu. It's back to Melinda of the News at 10. And thanks, Kyoto. And in the showbiz world, practitioners are already looking ahead of the big Grammy wins by Bonaboy and Whiskid as they seek to take advantage of the global attention to raise the stake of the industry. Conversations around investment, government support, and more are now on the front burner within the industry. Abidemi Dairo tells us more. Nigerians and lovers of Afrobeat are still basking in the big Grammy win for Bonaboy and Wizkid. Congratulatory messages from the president. Tubaba's proud message. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's an amazing feeling that in my lifetime it gets to happen from Nigeria, homegrown. And the frenzy on social media sums it all up. The conversation now is how can the industry leverage on this new attention? A 2017 report by the famed auditing firm PWC predicts Nigeria to become the world's fastest growing entertainment and media market by 2021. This is 2021 and the report isn't far from the truth with current global attention on Nigerian showbiz world. Melody, stop so the big question for Nigerian singer, record label executive and music producer Don Jazzy is, can the industry return on huge investment as it stands? Of course you can get your money back. You have to be patient. Invest, invest in the right people, um, have the right mindset and behavior of an investor. You, see, you have to be patient and let creatives create, give them time, and you, you definitely get your money back. While some of the practitioners are of the opinion that the industry isn't getting enough government attention to capitalize on this international attention, the Vice President, Professor Yemi Osimbajo, who virtually attended the Ogidi Studio launch in Lagos, said the government has provided enough catalysts for the industry to grow. In the last few years, the entertainment industry in Nigeria has literally exploded and is potentially a billion dollar industry. Last year, the federal government handed over the control of the National Theatre to the CBN and the Bankers Committee. The Bankers Committee has committed to an investment of 25 billion naira as initial funding for the development of the Nigeria Creative Centre to be located at the National Theatre. These funds will receive support from the Central Bank of Nigeria's Creative Industry Funds Initiative. Showbiz entrepreneur and pioneer general manager of Sony Music in West Africa, Michael Ugu, said beyond what government is taking credits for, some intangible actions like the appropriate laws and policies are equally important for the industry to thrive. You know, a music market and an industry is as valuable as its home market. You know, all these opportunities that Burner Boy, Wizkid and David will get, they're export opportunities. You know, in a typical country, you look at, what is at what's, the, what's the industry like at home? 
you know, we do need to create that conducive factor. Now, players are looking at the opportunities, private sector players. But again, I think it's a responsibility of government to create that conducive environment. I believe that there's been a copyright review that's been sitting, you know, with the House of Rep or House of Senate for years, right? And it's that kind of review that actually revalues the local IP and how we enforce the protect protection of that IP that I think, you know, needs to be now pushed through government. If we get simple, quick wins like that, then that would be great. Yes, it's a good time for the Nigerian showbiz industry within the international space. However, practitioners must make concerted efforts to ensure it maximizes all available opportunities. Abide Midairo, Channels Television News. And the main news again. The call for the reduction in the cost of governance got louder today as Governor Simon Lalong of Plateau State and APC Chief Paul Tinimbo lend their voices. The APC national leader also said despite exiting recession, Nigeria's economy remains weak as a result of unemployment and idle resources. As the news at 10 tonight, I'm Melinda Akinlami on behalf of the team. Good night.